Thank you for downloading my podcast, Therapists Talking Therapy. My name is Martin Weaver. In the world of psychotherapy, there is an argument that continues to rage. Well, rage might be too strong a word, but it's in constant discussion. And that is the issue of personal disclosure. How much, if anything, should the therapist tell the client about themselves? Before the days of the internet and social media, we could all hold our personal lives, if not secret, then at least hidden. Now the things that we do or say can be recorded and revived at a moment's notice, which is both good and bad. So we have to be careful about what we say about ourselves in this shared public space. In previous podcasts about psychotherapy, I've looked at boundaries, the sharing on social media, politics, and most recently an experience in my early 20s during the AIDS crisis, all what might be called professional practice. Some experiences can be helpful both directly, as in this is one way to work with an issue, or indirectly, as in this is evidence of my beliefs and values. Just like you, I'm human as well. So what have I shared about my life? which might not have been meant for client consumption and yet is available via the internet for clients to access. Well, it's April 2022 and I'm reminded that some years ago I used to do an occasional personal podcast for a friend of mine. His name was Edmund and he ran an internet radio show from his home, which was close to Birmingham, called Radio Kinva. Twelve years ago, in June 2010, I recorded a short podcast about the changes that were happening in the mainstream world and contrasted that with what was happening in my world. Specifically, the death of my father-in-law. And yet more surprisingly to me was the fact that it was only at that time and through that experience, I realised I had outlived my own father. This is what I said in 2010 and after playing this recording, I'll reflect on what I think now. I called this podcast... Who do I think I am? Today is April 13th. Today is an anniversary. Well, in all honesty, it was when I began to think and write this pot thought. And so it isn't as I speak it. And in fact, it's even further beyond April the 13th, as you are hearing it. However, an anniversary. Not that of a great event in history, but in 2010, today, April the 13th, there is one that is special to me. It's not a birthday, or the day that someone died, and neither is it something that I have done. No. And then the world intrudes. As one Prime Minister replied when asked about the things that he worried about, events, dear boy, events. Events at work, at home, and all over the world. A general election, a cloud of volcanic ash, some airline strike action, the continuing doom and gloom over the country's deficit, the need to make a living. All go to distract me from the anniversary. And another piece of news. My husband's father is very ill. He's taken into hospital and then into a hospice. He has lung cancer and heart problems. He is 89. Suddenly the grand, the immense, the broad issues of the day become eclipsed by the small, the intense, the personal. I am brought back to my anniversary, now somewhat receding behind me, I realise. Other issues intrude more immediate concerns. Edmund asked me to pen some thoughts about our election result. We were not at all certain, when we talked about the final result, how to respond to the new hung, balanced, some would say, Parliament. On May the 6th, election day, news comes that Roy's father is fading fast, and we need to fly to Glasgow that night, if we are to see him at all. After further updates and consultation, we actually fly a day later on the Saturday. He is stable, conscious, and actually quite bright. We relax. One father, although not fully well, and not likely to be so again, still lives. 
I'm reminded that weekend that I missed my anniversary. Maybe it wasn't so important after all. I called this podcast Who Do I Think I Am? after the TV series of a similar name, providing a focus for what was my anniversary. What was my anniversary? Well, on the 11th of March 1926, my father was born. Well, that happens to all of us. Then on the 3rd of October 1975, just 11 days after my 15th birthday, he died. This means that on the day he died, he reached the age of 49 years, 6 months and 23 days. I began to think about this and write this thought pod on April 13th, 49 years, 6 months, 23 days since I was born. On April 13th, 2010, I outlived my father. My first realisation was the difference between my father's life and my own. In 1926, television was first demonstrated by Baird. Puccini's opera Turandot premiered in Milan. Here in the UK we had our general strike with three million workers, and in Russia the Politburo threw out Trotsky and his followers, and Agatha Christie went missing. And of course later my father and millions of others lived through the Second World War. More scarily for me at this age, my age now, he had five children and had taken a job abroad in the Netherlands. He had, to use a phrase which was a favourite one of the last Conservative Party ministers, got on his bike and found a job in another country. He was the sole breadwinner, to use a very old expression, for six people other than himself. In my life there was only me and my husband, and we have direct responsibility for each other. We both work, and we have connections that my father could only dream of. Actually, in this case, that's not quite true. Given that my father designed orbiting satellites for the European Space Agency, that you can actually receive this podcast is a direct result of his work, or at least his profession. I feel sadness that he isn't here and that we haven't been able to talk, to share our experiences and to learn from one another. I don't know what his views would be of my sexuality and the life that I have created. My mother, <coughs> still very much alive at eight years, five months of the day, has told me that the issue was never discussed that she can remember. I passed a marker that day, April the 13th, although the exact nature of it still eludes me. The sensation is one of difference where perhaps I want there to be similarity. Certainly the world is very different. Perhaps the marker is one of simply the need to take stock. My father died 35 years ago and I didn't get the chance to say goodbye, or indeed anything. Not that we parted on bad or upset terms, just that his death was unexpected, unforeseen, sudden. Roy has had the good fortune to make peace with both his parents, and events if we intervene again. We are in a shop in Kingston, the hospice calls. We need to get there quickly, as Roy's father is close to death. Well, he is in Glasgow, and we are in deepest sorry. We hurry home, throw some things into a bag, jump in the car, and Roy drives. Just south of Birmingham, I take a phone call that tells me Roy's father has died. I have to tell my husband that his father is dead. We continue to Glasgow to support his mother and spend the rest of the week planning the funeral, which happens seven days later. So thoughts and comments about travellers delayed by a cloud of volcanic ash, our new coalition government, that summer seems finally to have arrived, are on pause. This is an interlude for me. A time for reflection, reappraisal, perhaps. Certainly time to let the world go on its own way for a while without me. Now that I'm older than my father reached, and Roy's father has died. Roy has 41 years to live before he outlives his father, where I am of an age that my father never reached. It's time for me to consider. Just who do I think I was intended to be? Who might I have become by this time? Who do I think I am?
The first thing that comes to my mind on listening again to this podcast is remembering the events in the world. The hung parliament, the volcanic ash, and driving from London to Glasgow. The fact that I outlived my father has somewhat diminished in its intensity. Back in 1975, my life changed irrevocably when, that Friday afternoon, I returned home from the weekly swimming lesson. I walked into our family home to be told by my older brother that, in his words, the old man's dead. That was it. Or as the new saying has it, and just like that, we became a one-parent family. That's often how the world changes. A single incident, an accident, a death. Even if that event is expected, and I had thought about my father dying, its actual fact, its reality, still has an impact. Even today. I've read that the size, the intensity of a bereavement never changes. It's that we grow to be bigger, more emotionally literate and more resilient. So although the pain is still the same, still as real, our ability to cope with it, to resolve it, grows and its effect essentially diminishes. Will I stop crying? Yes, because everyone does, as I did. Will the pain go away? Yes and no. It will change its shape, its intensity and its meaning as mine has done. Will I be happy again? Yes, because there is still a life to be lived, although it will be different as mine has been. It will still have value and purpose. Do I deserve to be alive? Yes. And all you have to do is to use this experience to help define what it is that you want to achieve, who you are and who you want to become. So that is what I can share with clients and friends who are faced with shock and bereavement. It's a worn out and perhaps even trite phrase to use and yet it is true that it's a journey. And only by sharing our personal experiences and travels sensitively and honestly can we hope to help and guide others. Thank you for downloading my podcast, Therapist Talking Therapy. I look forward to your company in the next podcast.